What are you hoping to accomplish by coming out? I want other people who have witnessed similar things or are part of certain things that are very controversial but end up being true to come out and understand that what's going on is not acceptable. And it this is just a facet of corruption. It may not be the political corruption that's coming out now that people are witnessing with their own eyes. People call them conspiracy theories. What I'm hoping to achieve is to get other people on board to understand that the government supports what we're doing because they were in the dark about this too. And now they're coming out and they're actually putting the hammer down. Uh, recent bills have been passing as far as the legislation through the Senate Intelligence Committee saying that these corporations have to give up the goods here in six months or else there's going to be some um, consequences they're going to face either through the judicial system, which obviously the government's got a lot of weight with that. The other aspect of it, too, is that they're going to ban these companies from doing contracting work for the government, which means they're going to lose billions of dollars. They're going to go broke. So I'm hoping that they actually comply with this measure because, one, this technology is going to help benefit humanity as a whole, not in a militaristic sense because that's just foolish. It's more to help out humanity because now everybody's going to be on the same level technology-wise. I think the common ground here and the, the narrative with that is you're hearing people come out, at least in the mainstream media, is trying to talk about ETs being evil. My event had nothing to do with ETs. And there's some misconstrued concepts that are going about. The technology may have came from ETs at, at one point, and that's what we witnessed. But we witnessed much more of a sinister plot with this that they're using it. Um, for people who don't know, 2009 during this operation, that's why we're responding, obviously, with the humanitarian nature of this, because 31st Marine Expeditionary Unit, that's mainly what the expertise is, at least as far as Marines go. It's not really combat operations for the most part, even though Indonesia, among other parts in that world, are large networks for terrorists and insurgents. Mm -hmm. So um, having that expertise of going in and trying to help people, I think is also good to us because it teaches you the balance of it. Instead of being a war fighter, you actually get to help people. Instead of you know, launching bullets at people, you're still helping people in a different cause. You still get to be heroes for people, which is great. So uh, totally incidental um, as far as our encounter, when we went onto the slope because we had our LZ, it was a hasty LZ, and they're dropping supplies. They have, you know, a bunch of stuff. And it's other helos, too. They're just kind of forming a perimeter around the city, dropping Marines here. You could provide Overwatch. Now, the only thing that's unsettling with this is the fact that they never gave us any comms. You know as well as I do how risky that is. You didn't have any comms? We didn't have any comms. Interesting. So the Marine that was with, was with me, it was a higher rank than me, was very pissed off about it because he was a Fallujah Marine, you know, so he went through a lot of shit. Yeah. And uh, one of those things, he, I remember him kept telling me, he's like, if, I, if everything ends up going to shit um, and you look at me and if I'm fine, it means that you're going to be fine. And I remember him tell, telling us all that in the stick, you know, and he was a, he's a good Marine. He's a very outstanding guy. I uh, learned a lot from him during my time in. And uh, I thought about that concept, but then he started picking things apart too. And he wasn't very comfortable with that. But the, luckily the thing was is that we were still relatively, you know, close enough to the LZ because when the bird was supposed to land, because obviously they were coming in, dropping the supplies, and they'd bank off. The last one that would come down would land. That's when we'd basically run to the helo, 300 meters, you're in good shape, and you have an average combat load, you know, 120 rounds, so to speak, with an M16A4 and a Camelback. Not really much, you know, so you can make that trek relatively quick. But they also have security on those birds, too. With the flight crew, with the gunners on the sides, they had 50s on them. So if there is some opposition, they're going to meet with those on top of us engaging them. So we were positioned near the slope. You know, it wasn't like a steep grade or anything, but it was enough to obscure what was going on on the other side that we had no idea what was going on. So we got, you know, naturally you want to take the high ground so you have observation of everything. And this is when we came across this operation. And it was something that stuck out like a sore thumb because here you have um, terrain that is a jungle terrain, very green vegetation, things like that. And then you have something that's sticking out right in the middle of an opening. And it looks very odd. It's something that's, you know, I'll remember to the rest of my life, to the day that I leave this earth, I'm going to remember seeing that. And it's just imprisoned up here. I had a camera with me. It was a Panasonic cheap camera. You know, it had kind of like, um, you know, 
ancient compared to what you got set up in the studio, you know. But it was enough at least because it was part of stuff that I would I've never did a humanitarian assistance before. Mm -hmm. So I was taking videos of them dropping stuff off, things like that, until we trekked up to this point. I was taking some pictures because it's a place you would never really ever go to, at least a real part of Indonesia. It's not like Bali or Surabaya where it's like uh, touristy stuff. Yeah, you know, this is where it's actual culture. People, you're actually seeing reality here. So it's stuff that I kind of wanted to document and just say, you know, I was a part of this. I can look back and say, you know, oh, I, I remember that. But then turning to looking north past that slope and seeing that down, and I took some video and some pictures of that. And um, I had, you know, I stuck it in my dump pouch. You know, I was a saw gunner naturally, you know, so I had M249. That was my favorite weapon. I liked having a belt-fed machine gun. As much as a pain in the ass, um, I liked having that compared to an M16 or an M4. So because we were in a humanitarian, all they did was give us a M16 A4s. You know, they had it, um, RCOs at that time. They weren't the ACOGs. They had the mills on the sides for windage and stuff yeah. like that, um, as well as the PEC-15s. You know, so if we were doing any kind of uh, night range or night operation, we'd have those with our pvs 14s So it was just a very basic loadout that we were, we were doing, you know, um, nothing really crazy. And when we saw this happen, saw this and I want to say unidentified because right now it's identified. Everybody knows what they are now. They're either man-made or they're not. And if they're not, the government's coming out and telling people, admitting it, not directly, but they're still admitting it to a degree that it, it exists. Because why would they spend time with this legislation coming out? That's, that's a good point. Why would they do that? If, it's, if it doesn't exist, why were they going through these measures to basically hold a gun up to these guys' heads and say, you better relinquish this technology or else? They're not just doing it, and uh, knowing and seeing this unfold, even being in this position of having to brief the Senate Intelligence among uh, the Special Intelligence Service, too, which oversees the letter agencies, because they have no idea what's going on either. But the fact that all of us coming together and making this loud amount of noise to get something done about it is just astounding. And now they're finally, for the first time in history, they're going through with this and actually trying to do something about it for their own understanding, but also know the corruption that comes from this. Yeah, it's multiple different facets. I mean, you get you guys already, all five of you, right? Already testified in front of Congress. So we testified to people of the Senate Intelligence Committee, which were there's some Congress people there as okay. well as some senators. So in front of the Intelligence Committee by yeah, the Senate. Yeah, and, and you know, yeah, and you know as well as I do, in any kind of setting like that, whether you're in a skiff, it's all under oath still because that's they're signing, having you sign NDAs and things like that. So you're expected to be truthful with this. Mm -hmm. And. Um, Seeing it's the reaction, a big deal. it is a very big deal. It was nerve wracking at first because I'm not used to talking to government officials in that nature. And um, having the support that they've been giving me as well as the protection is just something that I'm very thankful for. I'm very thankful that they all have open minds of this subject.